for Dr. Karen Tang to come on live with me. I think. Send her. See what happens. Um, so I'm waiting, send her a link so we'll see what happens. I was hoping we'd got smoother at this. Oh, there she is. Hi. Yay. <laughs> I'm sure there's a smoother way of doing this. I don't know. I, I'm terrible at these, by the way. I'm always just like, Whoa, like, <laughs> get a hot up like, hey. This time, there was like a preview that you could mm -hmm. like join yeah. together before you went yeah. live. Was there one last time? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And then we were like, okay. And then like, I think, I don't remember, but, um, but it's nice. Cause then you don't have like the first, like part of the recording being like, <laughs> that's all. That's Which you just on the Instagram where you were like messing with the screen for like two minutes. And so, yeah. What will happen on this one. Yeah. Hello, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's funny. I usually have two lights so that they don't like reflect off of the glasses, but my light bulb went out. So I look like I'm like dramatically like. <laughs> in the shadows on what it's fine but uh but yeah, yeah, yeah as long as you can see me that's all that matters we can so. see you and we can hear you and you look glad okay good yeah. okay perfect all right ready to go broken today cool uh, I, I i was overzealous in the gym so i pulled my love back and i was like rushing home from work i should have finished work midday um and i was rushing back and i was like actually i cannot rush things because i feel like a, a hundred year old woman right now yeah. it's all fine yeah 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 so it's great to see you last time we had a very international crowd so i'm very interested to see who joins us today and what countries they're from so um one that's joined us um but that's, yeah. that's all right we will post this up later um yeah exactly for everybody that's joining us on our uh, in youtube live uh we are basically two doctors who are fumbling around in the dark <laughs> trying to work out how to do this thing and uh this is really a platform for you to get in touch and ask us all the questions there's nothing off limits and nothing's off bounds uh we try and sort of have these youtube lives in about three different ways so we start off with just getting to know what we've been doing in the last couple of weeks because i've been sure. karen and she's been doing lots of interesting things uh, anything that's caught our eye and then we'll get down to all your questions as well so karen how oh. is it with the book I've had a lot of interesting things happen since we talked last. So I just finished my audiobook recording. And so that was really fun. Did you do your audiobook? Like, did you I narrate did. yours as well? It was quite an education. I, I made a few videos about that because it was such an interesting process. And for those of you who, who like audiobooks, like it will make you appreciate the smoothness with which audiobook professionals make these recordings because I messed up, I don't know how many takes like breathing wrong or like I would have a long sentence and like realize I didn't have enough breath to get through the sentence and be like, <gasps> like you know, just stop and do it again. I got a lot of Your dry. mouth got so dry. I had like three cups of tea and water just sitting there like, you know, I'd be like, excuse me. And like, I would just like chug water because just talking for hours, like your mouth gets incredibly dry and they can hear the difference. So like the engineer or the director would stop me and be like, can you just like switch some water because we can hear the dryness. And so it was it was quite a process. They were very kind to me and very patient for this complete newbie. But um, it was really, really fun. Um, and then, yeah, we're starting to get the advanced reader copies out to people. So I just over the weekend uh, started seeing some of the books kind of popping up on social media, like, you know, with the, with the tags. And it's very exciting to see that the 
book baby is starting to be birthed <laughs> very slowly into the world. Um, so that's been quite an exciting part of the process. And so we're we're planning some fun events. Um, just on kind of like a personal level, I, I don't know if you saw, like I, I saw Jonathan Van Ness on Saturday. I don't know if Queer Eye is as popular in the UK. Like, do, do you guys have Queer Eye on Netflix? But it is very, very popular. Oh my gosh. And Jonathan is one of the coolest human beings like in the entire world. Like so, you know, funny and and sweet, but also very like intelligent and interested. Like they have um, a podcast called Getting Curious, um, which is literally just about like completely random topics that Jonathan's interested in. He gets like an expert and they talk about, you know, like archaeology or like the history of like cosmetics or like, you know, ancient China. And so it's very fascinating to kind of like, you know, talk with Jonathan about, you know, all these interesting topics. Um, and uh, I'll be um, going on getting curious in a couple of months. So we'll be planning that soon. So it's be very fun. Um, so that's me. How about you? What have you been up to? Um, all sorts of everything. I'm uh, still doing BBC Breakfast and this morning we've had lots of health items that we've been covering, just generically lots of different things that are happening within the NHS system. Um, I think the most significant thing which I was really hoping to sort of tell you about is mostly working. One of the biggest things that we've had is the Women's Health Summit this year. So that happened yeah. on um, the 18th of January. So mm -hmm. since conversation with each other and um, we've had for the second time in history in the UK a female health secretary called Victoria Atkins. Mm -hmm. Victoria Atkins joined Maria Crawford who is the other woman who is running uh, the women's health strategy. So in the UK we've got a 10-year strategy to make sure that we um, optimize and upscale women's health so that we don't have health inequalities but also that we can look at healthcare being delivered to the communities who are the most deserving in areas that are really lacking. So everything from birth trauma, which you and I have spoken about, yeah. men menstrual health, contraceptive, mm -hmm. and also looking at uh, equality of care when it comes to breast cancer. Well, also all the five gynecological cancers. Yes. Yeah. Interesting to hear uh, Victoria Atkins, actually, she shared her own birth trauma. trauma. Oh, wow experience which um for a, a sitting politician uh was really eye-opening but also shows yeah. how far we've got to go. but also things haven't changed that much either. Yeah. and yeah. really fascinating so um off the back of that i then headed up the um uh a parliamentary event my first house of commons event uh, <laughs> where i was uh chairing a panel um, for women who have been experiencing or have experienced or survivors of breast cancer, but particularly for oh, wow. black community. So it was run by a really amazing organization in the UK called Black Women Rising. And it's founded by uh, an incredible woman called Leanne Pero, and she is actually a survivor of breast cancer. The statistics in the UK are really shocking. So we know 40% of black women die from breast cancer compared to their white counterpart. Uh, uh -huh. Black and Asian women are the groups that we are still struggling with to go for breast cancer screening. Um, and we also find that there are then later on, once they get into the breast cancer care, there are health inequalities. So, for example, the cold caps might not fit the right head because they're all mm -hmm. made in Asian population. The breasts yeah. of women are offered after mastectomies are still um, sort of uh, peach coloured or very. Yeah. Asian coloured, which obviously mm -hmm. on darker black skin, you're you don't very noticeable, yeah. Yeah. And I always say you should flip that around. You know, if you're a white person uh going through a mastectomy, just the trauma of mastectomy is enough. But then you end up finding that at the end of it, you've gone through all of that, and then the surgeon offers you a black breast softy. Like, how would yeah. you yeah. the only skin tone? And they always yeah. say you know what it's uh, sand colored or it's it's um it's generic and it's for for e equally for everybody and you're absolutely right you could argue that everybody is getting a breast softy as they're going through it mm -hmm. why does making sure that we have different skin tone matters but honestly mm -hmm. a woman who's gone through a mastectomy her whole being her sexuality her femininity yeah. uh, her confidence to uh show her loved one or her partner her breast afterwards uh, mm -hmm. is massively hindered when 
there's a different, complete different skin tone in some cases. Right. It's so noticeable and it's so overt. Yeah. And I don't know whether that's something that you have in the US, something that comes up often. You know, I actually don't know much um, because uh, I don't uh, personally take care of breast cancer patients. So, but I'm sure it's an issue. Like, I can't imagine that it's not like a specific issue. But I also just wanted to point out just like uh, whenever I hear you talking about kind of your involvement, um, you know, with government and like these panels and, and um, you know, uh, kind of, you know, consulting efforts where they're really looking to healthcare experts to guide policy and making change. Um, I always feel very jealous because I feel like in the U.S. we don't have that. (laughs) It's so whatever, you know, like I'm like, we've talked quite a few times about, um, you know, like the differences between the U.S. and the U.K. systems. And I do feel like, um, you know, when you were teaching me about access to contraception, um, abortion, um, cancer screenings, it, it just, is it seems so much more simple to get access to those things in the UK. Like, for instance, like you talked to me about, you know, contraception, like it seems like, you know, there are contraceptive clinics, like, you know, you can ask your GP, like you can go to the pharmacy. It just seems like they really want to make sure people can access this. And in the US, it's just like, good luck to you. Like, try and figure it out on your own, like, navigate the system, you know, no matter what health, you know, inequities and social inequities there are in your way, it's like, it, it's up to you. And so um, I do feel like, you know, obviously every system has its faults, but I do appreciate whenever I hear this, it seems like at least your government is really like looking to experts, looking for guidance, like trying to kind of make these policy type changes to, to improve everyone's access. So. I mean, we can definitely do more. And I think that mm-hmm. You've also got to think about, I mean, I'm talking just about England as well, because I'm based mm-hmm. so right. we're an island. We're very, very small compared to the yeah. US. Massive. So I can only so imagine. So sprawling, yeah. Yeah, so sprawling. I can only imagine healthcare sort of inequities, trying to get that out there to everybody in the UK, in the US is going to be huge. Also, mm-hmm. I'm actively involved because of a, an incredible charity that I work with called Wellbeing of Women, which is the yeah. Only- I was about to say, talk more about that because you guys, I, I keep seeing these amazing efforts that you're doing. Yeah, please tell us kind of what that is and, you know, the work that you're doing. Ambassador, um, so, uh, the reason that so much stuff happens in the UK um, is because of grassroots organisations and charity work, actually. I think mm. uh, healthcare wouldn't be bolstered if it wasn't for in- incredible individuals, experienced individuals giving up their time for free. I'm going to put myself mm. there because I think I'm that person. <laughs> <laughs> you're like i'm giving up my time for free. <laughs> but it's true take the credit take it yeah <laughs> but essentially up until the pandemic you know i was working in my clinics and my surgery not really thinking about what's happening in the wider context because you're very French, you're right i've got to do my clinics and, and and get through the numbers and then the pandemic hit and something crazy happened where i ended up on bbc and started looking at oh my goodness there's a wider group of people who feel unseen and unheard and mainly because mm-hmm. of they saw another woman who looked like they're mm-hmm. wearing a job talking about women's health and to me i was mm-hmm. like i've always looked like this and this is what i've always been doing behind my closed doors you know for the last mm-hmm. seven years and then I understood that there were loads and loads of charities. I knew that there was charity work, but it was only happening in my local area. Wellbeing of Women is a charity, the only charity in the UK that looks after from sort of cradle to grave for women and girls yeah. and does everything from menstrual health to fertility to menopause. Um, the one thing that it doesn't look after is actually the gynecological cancers. And that's because we've got mm-hmm. other, other charities like Eva P. So focus on those particularly. And what Wellbeing of Women do is that charities have a lot of noise and they've got a lot of kudos when it comes to getting governments to listen to them. Because we have them where if there is something that's uh, lacking, then I have to be honest that the transparency of the system is such that a bit like the US, basically, they get evidence and they want to hear what's happening on the ground. And Mm -hmm. so go to parliamentary uh, evidence collection. So um, it is quite scary. You go a bit like the Senate, I suppose, where you go in and you, mm-hmm. and I suppose you posted that really great video of um, uh, the CEO of TikTok giving evidence oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like that. And you go in and there are MPs from across the board, all parliamentary MPs, and you give evidence of what you're seeing on the ground as a clinician. That's so amazing. The health inequalities, and it's all evidence-based data. And they take that, mm-hmm. and they formulate what they're going to do next from it. And from that came the fact that actually across the board, 
um, there's a massive inequalities and well-being of women are part of that. So I'm part of the Menstrual Health Coalition. So that's mm-hmm. looking at period problems within the country and also the Menopause Coalition. So that's looking mm-hmm. at menopause. And one of the things that we found was that grassroots organisations don't trust the national health system because mm-hmm. in COVID they've been let down so badly. And I don't know what it's like in the US whether COVID was a breaking point to show the inequalities in healthcare, which I think it was. Absolutely. 1,000, yes, absolutely. In Chicago, mm-hmm. I read that there was like, you know, 90% of deaths were Black and Asian groups from COVID. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Because of such uh, inequalities, grassroots organisations learnt how to communicate with themselves and educate themselves um, with ambassadors like myself who speak that language and from each of those communities. So what I did in the last two years was start mapping these groups. And I realized that there was so much work that was happening. And rather than reinvent the wheel is get Mm -hmm. these groups not to work in silos. So if you said to me, Dr. Nagat, what are Bangladeshi women doing in Luton and Manchester? Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, oh, Dr. Karen, I map Mm -hmm. them for you. Here are the Bangladeshi Mm -hmm. women in Luton and here are the Bangladeshi women in Luton and Mm -hmm. Manchester. And this is the work that they're doing in order to communicate with their communities. It means that then that way, we're not just giving equal health care, but we're giving health care which are specific to that community. Yeah. Because as you all know, and as you pointed out in your videos, Singaporean communities and Chinese communities are completely different. Different things. Yeah, exactly. Like every community has its own needs and like culture and yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, anybody that, is like, say, Vietnamese or Singaporean or Chinese, genetically they look similar, but they're clumped into one. Mm -hmm. And I thought your video was one of the really sort of significant sort of highlights to show, hang on, you cannot clump these people into one. It's racist. You can't do that. So racist. (laughs) I'm sorry, we should laugh. Welcome to America. (laughs) Oh, God. Yeah. But even, yeah, like, you know, like language, like even if people speak the same language, completely different cultures, completely different backgrounds. And yeah, it's, and then, like you said, it applies to health as well. Like people are just like all Asians, all black communities, like, you know, like very, very, very different needs and ways to approach. Yeah. The number of times where, because the image of Muslim women is that they are oppressed or suppressed, Mm -hmm. like the number of times that I've been sort of been in a conversation where somebody has turned around and said oh you're like us like <laughs> I'm like hang on like, <laughs> this, this what, what, what you, like. <laughs> the, you know and it's just like oh you you sort of have the same needs and wants as us and I'm like yeah because you're in yeah <laughs> what the beat like the news that's not yeah. that's Muslim women that you see on the news or documentaries I mean there are a proportion unfortunately due to horrific events but I I think sort of changing that narrative is so important because the image through movies and media and everything else has always been that a woman wearing a hijab is 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 a quite muted woman Mm -hmm. and and I think that that's the sadness when it comes to sort of delivering health care the people who make guidelines or write the guidelines still have that viewpoint of what they read in books and papers and newspapers without actually going to that community and going okay no actually Pakistani women and Bangladeshi women are completely different mm-hmm. Black women and South Asian women are completely different and that's when you start then going into equity of care because yeah. you're dealing with what they actually want and not just going right this is a blanket approach to everybody right absolutely I love that so we've been we need you to run everything i want you to <laughs> to like rise in the government and actually like you know have the power to kind of you know to make all these changes because you're you obviously do so with like both like um like evidence-based and like very intelligent and thoughtful but also very you know perceptive and understanding of the the needs of different communities so and, okay. and yeah. beyond that beyond the sort of basic you know black white south asian you know that sort of uh ethnicity but also I want to know about the hearing impaired community. What is that actually? Mm-hmm. Menopause care or even abortion care? What is mm-hmm. the impaired community? How do they deal with, say, accessing abortion or neurodiverse communities, ADHD, yeah. 
how do they manage their ADHD symptoms and say now they're heading into perimenopause? And we actually don't have any data on things like that. And I just think um, yeah. crazy, it's 2024. And yeah. I, had, I was speaking to one of my patients who is um, uh, um, hearing impaired um, and she's deaf and she goes to me, do you know, in British Sign Language, we don't have a word for menopause. And I was thinking, hang on, what? In British Sign Language? And that's, what? Yeah. So that's when you realise, actually, wow. we instantly think about barriers from those communities where it's, you know, Black or Asian or for whom English is not their first language. But I met mm -hmm. this really lovely sort of um, Russian woman and she goes to me, I'm Russian to all intents and purposes, walking into any GP practice or to see a doctor, I'm a white woman. Mm -hmm. I open my mouth and they realize that English isn't my first language. I can't navigate myself and I'm disregarded just because. Wow. I the and communication I barrier. Wow. Yeah. I just thought, oh my goodness, like we, we aren't catering to these communities. So it, it's, it's, it's beyond. So now I just call them marginalized communities because I don't yeah. have for it um and not try and clump them into one so what i've been doing is something called the health collective and as that grows hopefully i'll be able to give you some more information but i've done some videos already good for you this is so amazing i like like i'm always so inspired when i talk with you and it makes me feel very lazy <laughs> like, what am i doing with my time it's like you're like transforming the you know national health service <laughs> like single animal. Oh, I, oh. I, I, today even i was looking at I, I'm really bad because I did clinic and then sat and I was like, oh my God, everybody's doing such amazing work. And it, uh, social media, every, it's all those highlights. Like in real yeah, life. Yeah, I was about to say, it's a very misleading process, like social media, because it's so much like the highlights. And then you're like, you, you have to get over your imposter syndrome. Like, you know, I'm doing important things. I'm doing some stuff. Oh. But you're, yeah. Oh. Um, I, I think you got a couple of questions from your followers. They're like, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah, so say, do you want to do five questions? Because um, uh, we had so many, uh, I had so many questions that are coming in, and I just thought I'm going to fire them at you. So yeah, go for yeah. it. And then at the end, we'll just end with any funny stories that you might want to share. Um, I have, I don't have a really funny story, but I think I, I have a very sort of cute story, which I thought would be quite good. But the oh, first I love that. Okay. that I thought we'd go on a little bit of a journey. A really quick question yeah. I keep getting, but I haven't had a chance to make any con. Can you lose your tampon? Okay. Oh, like, can it get lost in your body? Yeah. Uh, people think that, but no, because um, it's not like kind of an unending pathway. Like it ends at your cervix. Um, or if you've had a hysterectomy, it ends at the top of the vagina. Um, so sometimes it's just out of reach of where your fingers can reach, um, but it's always in there. So, um, you know, if you uh, can't reach it, a partner can't reach it, you're not sure if there's a tampon in there. A lot of times people aren't quite sure. They're like, did I take it out? I don't know. And I can't feel anything. Just go to your gynecologist or your, to your GP. Um, you know, this, you are definitely not the only person it's happened to. It happens quite a bit. Um, and, you know, we are happy to just kind of do a super quick exam and just see if there's something there. Because sometimes people do like, um, you know, like lose track and they're not quite sure. Um, so don't be embarrassed. Like I said, it, it very, very common thing for, for people to kind of like just lose track of them. But they won't like disappear inside your body forever. Like there's always a way to get it out. So. Yeah. I would say like um, with the clean fingers, if you squat down, say in the bath or something, run your fingers up your vagina, you'll feel something mm -hmm. like the nose. Now, the opening of the cervix is not going to be as big as this. Right. So <laughs> I like how you just like at the visual aid right there. You're just like, not like this. Yeah. <laughs> So the yeah. tampon cannot go up the cervix yeah. into that hole and then into your womb because it's actually yeah it's even a smaller <laughs> opening like this it's like a tiny little opening so you'll bump into the cervix and it won't keep going yeah right we need to edit this and put this <laughs> love it it's really small so you won't lose it and it doesn't end up in your lungs or something like that yeah. so tampons don't fall but they can the other way come out if uh, obviously uh, they, like anything, they can fall out if you're in the toilet, etc. So the other question that I had for you, Dr. Karen Tang, is, and this is actually on the back of my video that I posted today about topical vaginal estrogen. I'm on my oh, high okay. topical vaginal estrogen. So mm -hmm. can topical vaginal estrogen make your fibroids worse? 
No. So, um, you know, like everything else in, in women's health, like we always kind of have the caveat, like, do we have like amazing amounts of research on this? No. But um, in general, there are studies on like, um, you know, systemic hormones, like birth control, hormone replacement therapy, um, and they are not really shown overall to impact the size of fibroids um, or symptoms from fibroids. Um, and when you think about like, you know, topical estrogen is so minimally absorbed through the vagina that almost none of it is detectable like in your bloodstream um, compared that with like the noticeable difference that you get from like taking like, you know, like a birth control pill or, um, you know, hormone replacement therapy patch or, you know, pill. Uh, so it shouldn't. Um, I always kind of point out to people too, because, you know, when you're postmenopausal and you're using any sort of supplemental estrogen, especially like vaginal, you're kind of just trying to get it to where it was back when you were premenopausal. You're not taking like extra, extra on top of like a normal premenopausal level. You're just kind of trying to play catch up. So, um, you know, it really shouldn't make a big noticeable difference at all. Like, and, and that's why, you know, more and more, and I know you've done a couple of great posts on vaginal estrogen and like, you know, like safety and pretty much most breast cancer patients, like people worry about that. Um, you know, almost none of it gets absorbed. And so um, it, that's the the one type of estrogen that we are like, you know, like if you need it, use it, like, um, you know, talk to your doctor, obviously, because there are a few very rare exceptions. People with breast cancer are like aromatase inhibitors. But, um, you know, in general, use it with a clear conscience that you're not going to like, you know, make your fibroids worse or endometriosis history or that sort of thing. Okay, perfect. And this is going to be a big year because um firstly we should just say what are fibroids i forgot to ask you that oh yeah so <laughs> i need to make a long youtube video about fibroids because i get a lot of questions i just never managed to make a video about it but they're benign tumors uh of the muscle uh in the wall of the uterus so if you picture i always tell people like picture your uterus like a pear um so the flesh of the pear is muscle and fibroids are basically little tumors that can grow from those muscle cells and they can be incredibly tiny or they could be massive um um, you know, almost all of them are totally benign, meaning non-cancerous, and they're very, very common. So um, up to 70% of white men, women, 80% of black women. I always get the question, how many Asian women? And honestly, I don't know, because again, there's no like data. On no that. I'm sure it exists, but um, in America, we don't talk about it. Um, but it's incredibly common benign tumors. So if you were to get an ultrasound and your doctor says, oh, you find fibroids there, that in and of itself is not something, you know, to get worried about because we very often find them. Um, but they can cause lots of heavy bleeding and pain and put pressure on your other organs if they get bigger. Um, so if you're having any issues like that, then do talk to your doctor. They can get an ultrasound and look for fibroids. And then um, the other thing, this is going to be a biggie one, because actually I was thinking this would be perfect for us to discuss um, a, mm -hmm. sort of a, a follower of ours who's been sort of checking out our content. And she's just been diagnosed with PCOS, polycystic mm -hmm. ovary, and mm -hmm. said, I have kids because I'm really worried that this might affect my chance to have kids. Yeah, so PCOS is inc also incredibly common. It's the most common endocrine condition of reproductive age women, so polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, again, we'll have to make a video about this because it's so much to talk about. Um, it's a hormone imbalance that usually leads to like higher, you know, levels of testosterone or testosterone symptoms, which can include like acne, um, facial and body hair, um, and it can also affect um, ovulation. Uh, how often you release eggs from your ovaries that can throw off your periods, make them, you know, go missing or become very irregular. Um, and it's also very highly associated with what we call metabolic conditions like high cholesterol, diabetes, and pre-diabetes, um, and uh, high blood pressure. So um, it very, very often affects many parts of someone's health. So um, it can affect fertility because if you are not ovulating regularly, obviously, if there's a month that you don't release an egg, you can't get pregnant that month. So it is a common cause of fertility issues. Um, not everyone with PCOS has fertility issues, you you know, for sure, um, you know, someone can have PCOS and actually ovulate pretty frequently and pretty regularly. So it's only if someone's like missing a lot of, you know, periods, um, has been trying to get pregnant and then, you know, hasn't been successful, um, you know, within like a few months, like we would say, go see like a fertility specialist. And there's a different system in the UK, but, you know, usually we would say like, if you are skipping periods right off the bat, 
just go see the fertility specialist. So you don't have to wait like a full year. Like, you know, normally, you know, before we refer someone to see a specialist, um, you know, we say like, well, try on your own for like, you know, six months, a year, depending on how old you are. Um, you know, if you're missing your periods, you don't have to like wait, like you can don't pass go, like go right to the specialist just to kind of get tested and talk about different options. Um, we will say it actually, of all the things that cause problems getting pregnant, uh, PCOS is actually one of the, you know, more straightforward ones to treat because you have plenty of options to, you know, get someone to release those eggs. So there are plenty of eggs. That's why the polycystic ovary like appearance, you have lots of these little follicles ready to go. You just need to trigger them to release. And so um, there's a lot of different medications and things that can uh, be effective for that. And if it really sort of reassures anyone watching this, I have PCOS. Um, oh, so, yeah. Yeah. So um, I've had lots of laser therapy to my face to try and get rid of all of the hairs. Um, and mm -hmm. it's really, really scary when you're told that. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have lots of, um, so my hormone profile isn't so awful. And actually, mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't have that many cysts. It was just that mm -hmm. I had period so it's a mm -hmm. bit of a dilemma that you have to have cysts to have PCOS yeah. Yeah. cysts and I've had three children um it did take me a little bit slower to fall pregnant mm -hmm. but it's all about sort of being really great with your health and your diet and mm -hmm. I'm always going to maintain a healthy weight I'm never mm -hmm. going to be a size 8 or a size 10 I'm a size 12 and I've always tried to maintain a size 12 so mm -hmm. I know it's going to be everybody's on a different journey with their PCOS and if it just reassures you even further um Victoria Beckham has PCOS oh, oh I, that's right I forgot yeah. about that yeah Thompson has PCOS and so mm -hmm. it is actually one in 10 women uh, are affected incredibly common yep really common um and there are real clear guidelines uh, in nice so if you google nice pcos there are guidelines of um what can be offered to you and what you should be entitled to so always use those to advocate for yourself so and mm -hmm. i up everything uh dr karen has said as well yeah um, and actually you bring up a good point about the just kind of general like lifestyle care and like you know like um nutrition um because someone um you know like there's sort of this um there's a lot of myths about pcos like one is that you have to have polycystic ovaries you don't it's a terribly named condition like it's just horrible like i, I put in my book painful. you know nothing about pcos seems to make sense including that you don't have to have polycystic ovaries to have pcos um but the other is that you know it, a myth is that everyone is obese like you know you have to lose a certain amount of weight and like that's absolutely not true so you know you, there's people with what we call slim pcos who you know clearly should not be losing weight um and and we never say like you have to lose x pounds it's never about that it's about health um because um we think that the insulin and the diabetes and blood sugar part actually plays a role so you know sometimes it's just a matter of like seeing a registered dietitian and just kind of adjusting like kind of the like you know like glycemic profile and things and that can maybe help with your insulin levels that might help to regulate your period. So there's a lot of that just about being like healthy and aware of your overall health rather than, you know, so, you know, like in the past, I think even, you know, doctors for sure were like way too focused on numbers on a scale and that was not helpful. So, um, so yeah, it's about overall well-being and health. So. And, and that I think is a really key point because what people always worry about is that um, they look, they look for PCOS in in bigger people, but actually mm -hmm. the healthy or health you know, slimmer looking people, if I can say that, um, mm -hmm. that means that you get underdiagnosed depending on. And we should never use body shape to be the bit that we right. diagnose. But also, um, you know, if you are really struggling to lose weight and you're doing everything right, and you're, you know, the the mental health is like I'm the person that's failed. But actually, there are more and more data to come through to show that PCOS is probably a genetic factor mm -hmm. so that's your genetics and your body shape is going to be determined by your genetics because your body is built that way not all of us are going to be the exact same body as whatever we see in the media so uh just take that into account as well so i always say to people be kind to yourself talk nicely yeah. to your is um your body shape and i'm i'm really bad about it because i see myself on tv and i'm like oh my god the double chin is showing oh no you look gorgeous <laughs> on tv by the way like i totally get that pressure as well but you yeah. know your body is genetically programmed to be a certain shape and size and that comparison yeah. uh, shouldn't be there so thank you so much uh thank you for joining us i can't believe our half an hour's gone i know it just flew by this is like uh, whenever we talk we're always like oh my god it's been an hour and we've been chatting forever but yeah thank you everyone for joining us um <laughs> 
I, I love our chats. These are great. Like, I think it's a good combo of, you know, like everybody send us your questions because I, I think it's really fun and, and keeps us kind of, you know, aware of what people are interested in and what they want to hear from us. Um, I love having the kind of, you know, like the, you know, question and answer uh, aspect of things. And then, you know, like hearing from what cool stuff you're doing, all of it's great. So the pond although I, I wanted to finish on something interesting that caught my eye which I wanted to sort of leave you with because this is actually in the nice guidance so um, we've had the updated um, antenatal guidelines um, and for uh, labor pain non-pharmaceutical treatments is now small injections of sterile water into the lower back wow I, have you heard of okay, that? okay. I don't know. I mean, I mean, I know about like, like things like tens units and like pain yeah. and like, maybe it's just like something about kind of like the distracting factor. I'm, I'm not sure. Like, you know, I don't know the. It's made it into the guidelines. So they're in the guidelines. There are, so I, I've looked at them and there are non-pharmaceuticals. So breathing exercise, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. tens, machine, there's, mm -hmm. acupuncture, there's yoga, um, mm -hmm. there's forms of meditation that they can and there's even a small study about sort of trying even before a woman goes into labor hypnosis and I know some doulas do a lot of incredible work as well so but um it, you know the updated guidelines and it's gone into nice is now small injections of sterile water which oh. I I am going to pick apart the data for that so we will talk about I'm so it. curious yeah please tell me <laughs> it's just like a one-time injection or do they do like repeated injections over the course of the labor or actually two heated injections and the effect lasts from 10 minutes to 30 minutes depending on the woman but i don't know reek of misogyny with this i'm just like so a woman in labor pain the dark side i know that seems like a lot of pain to be <laughs> overcome with just like little injections of water but i mean again i'm no pain special in, like in terms of labor pain <laughs> yeah so um that i think isn't funny but mm -hmm. just Ah, so intriguing. Intriguing. In twenty four, hmm. the guideline is is woman in labor who's in intense pain. Um, before you escalate to say you know opioids or try and give a pain relief or an epidural, try sterile water in her back. And I was thinking, if a man was having a vasectomy, right? Would we? I'm like, <laughs> give, give the pain medication. Yeah, just go right to it. Yeah, you know, I'm just like you know. I mean, if someone was like really opposed to having an epidural or, you know, I, I could see being like, okay, like tell me all of my options that aren't, you know, invasive, but it just seems, yeah, like, like you said, like, <laughs> like a man was pushing out a baby. I don't think they would be like, just give these little injections of like water. I had three children. I had an epidural for my first and oh. my mother was like, oh my God, that's such a failure. You've had an epidural. Um, and I don't know why she thought that was the case. And this is so funny. I think this is maybe a traditional thing. There's a special route uh, that you have to buy from like India or Pakistan. She got that route uh, posted over to her in the UK. And so when I went into labor pain, she goes to me, wait, 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 wait. I have to put this route into water because it will absorb the water, which obviously most routes do. And that will take away your pain. And I just looked at my mother and I was like, you crazy. What do you do with the root? Like, what, what are you supposed to do with it? Apparently, like yeah, like you don't eat it or anything. Apparently, okay. you don't drink it. You just, you don't drink it or anything. And apparently, if you do that, I mean, this is like the mythology and the craziness that women. So, my mother was like, you cannot go into labor until I put these roots into some water. And she did it in front of me. And I was just looking at her going, <laughs> Or oh, actually a crazy woman. Like, I mean, to all intents and purposes, I think. <laughs> don't laugh. Amazing. She felt, she felt that she was so helpless as my mother. So she was yeah. just, I'll just put these roots in some water and that'll take the pain away from my daughter. And I was the first, obviously, of her babies. I don't yeah. know. We could do a whole, like, live discussion about just, like, the crazy, just, like, you know, myths <laughs> about pregnancy and childbirth and different cultures like you know in Chinese stuff my mom was always like don't lift your arms you'll have a miscarriage I'm like how would that even work like she was like don't lift your arms over your head I'm like what is that gonna like drop pregnancy out like I don't know yeah. um you know also like baby just drops apparently like, yeah or like um you know postpartum like there's this big thing you know that you can't get cold which I'm like I understand like you know just kind of keep yourself like 
you know, taken care of, like, don't go out into a snowstorm, but like, um, you know, it just like the concept of like, you know, even just like leaving your house, she's like, don't go outside. I was like, oh, we have something. Oh, yeah. 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 It's called um, Jalius. Jalius is like, so it's translated loosely as 40 days. So for uh -huh. 40 days, you can't leave the house, you can't go. Yeah. And then after 40 days, get this, you're meant to bathe in rose water and milk. Ice. <laughs> Sounds lovely. <laughs> it's like <laughs> spa treatment. That sounds delightful. Like, and yeah. to bathe in rose because apparently then all the afterbirth comes away by forty days, and you can't okay. have those forty days. Yeah. And the baby is meant to be like nursed and suckled and looked after. But essentially, after having the baby, for your jolliest, you're meant to be cocooned, and then after forty days, you come out like a chrysalis butterfly. Because you're like. But so when I first heard about this, so like in Chinese too, it's the same thing. It's like to to make a month, like you know, it's all yeah. It's like there's like you you make a month, and you literally like are just like nurtured, and they feed you, and you just rest, and someone helps take care of the baby. I'm like, it's fabulous. Like I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> like I don't know why this culturally doesn't expand, but then just like in between that, they're like, well, you can't wash your hair because that makes you. Oh too yeah, we cold. have. Uh, no, you yeah, can't, uh, but you can't bathe. In I mean, I wash my hair, but like special water. You can't bathe in this. <laughs> Water, apparently <laughs> like this yeah they said like you like, like the official way is like you have to like bathe with like alcohol like wine to keep it warm like because that won't like cool your body like water will and so it was just very interesting to hear kind of like the different components of like kind of become part of this experience but I was just like you know nurturing the mom and letting her rest and feeding her and you know like helping take care of the baby I was like oh, amazing like that should be <laughs> universal yeah I would literally milk that. I'd be like, I want like oh. RTA champagne. Yeah. <laughs> just like, I'm milk it for everything. I mean, I didn't even want champagne. As they as have well. like in Asia, they have these like like postpartum like birth like like luxury suites that are you know they they make this part of the experience is basically like go on a spa retreat for like a month. <laughs> and, like it sounds great. They told me I'm in the wrong continent. <laughs> <laughs> Like in Asia with these spa retreats, once I had three. Oh, weeks. America's just like you know, go back to work in two yeah. weeks. Good luck. <laughs> well, yeah, out on the same day. Like if you've had a baby, they're like uh -uh, get out. That's it. We're done. We've done it now. <laughs> oh my god. Um, anyway, well, that was a fun way to end it. I like that. <laughs> like, that was so fun. Thank you so much. Very nice. Awesome. We'll be yeah. Uh, we've had no comments, but that's okay. That's all right. Uh, we'll be back every fortnight for your pleasure and I'll bring back more funny stories to share. I love it. All right, great. All right, see you everybody. Right, bye. I was like, I don't think I can end it. Let's see. Um...